folks. Welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live, download our free app, and stream all of our live local shows, including the Jim Parisi Show. Hello. Yeah, how you doing, Ron? I was just, gonna, I was just introducing you. I wanted to bring in a, a legendary character and a musician and a guy who... Uh, has high standards for himself and is also uh, continually painted on his palette and continuing the lineage of music, teaching younger cats, traveling the world, uh, still basically making uh, a, a large living in Europe. Um, but uh, it all started here in New York, uh, in, in Detroit, and jazz started in this country. Ron Carter, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks for a very warm welcome, and this is warm outside, so it's all fitting. Yeah, well, I'm in Tucson, man, so it's warm. I know you're having a heat wave in, in New York, but it, it, it ain't. I don't know, I don't know, man. It's hard to beat this heat wave we're having, but anyway, how are you, and thank you, and all of your fans for supporting your show. Oh, man, thank you. It's We're cooking, man. I, you know, I, I wanted to just start by asking you if you could talk about um, your concept of the birth of the cool. Uh, that's around the time that you started to play with Stan Getz. And I just wanted you to talk about how Stan fit into that time period. Well, you know, I, I don't know about my, my first exposure to, my real exposure to Stan Getz was to some of the records he made with David Gillespie uh, called At the Opera House with Sonny Stitt and, and Ray Bryant and, and uh, uh, for, for, for musicians only. It's a great record, and Stan Getz sounds fantastic. That was my first real paying attention to him. And my next paying really attention to him was a record there with uh, Astro Gilberto when they brought the Brazilian music with the Bossa Nova beat to American consciousness. And my next exposure to him was when he called me to help to make some gigs with him. And I told him my price, and he told me I was too expensive. <laughs> and he hung up. That's my exposure to Stan Getz. Mm, okay, so uh, I, when I interviewed Kenny Barron, he talked about for musicians only. I've never found it on vinyl. Uh, it's 1955. And can you talk about? I, I actually I want to know your your first bebop gig uh, because uh, I was really unaware that Stan was such a player in the bebop world. But where were you at in the mid 50s? Were you still in Detroit? I was in school at Eastman School of Music, 55 through 59. I didn't arrive in New York until uh, the August of 1959 when I graduated, and I had, role, had, it, had theoretically enrolled in the Manhattan School of Music for a master's degree. And then when I got a chance to go to Europe with Cannonball Adderley the spring of 19, 1960, 1960 uh, I asked the school if I could delay my admittance for a, a, a semester, and they said yes. So I re-enrolled the fall of, 60, the fall of 1960 and got a master's in 1961. So my exposure to the pure development of bebop was much delayed. However, I, I did make some records with Barry Harris and made some gigs with him, and uh, that's, for me, it's a free school. Uh, but, uh, I mean, i got to believe up at, in the Eastman School of Music, I mean, there were cats driving around with hearsts, with, with organ trios. You must have been playing up there live at those clubs. I can't remember the name of the club, but you were playing bebop up there. I, I was playing at the, Rich, at the Ridgecrest Inn. I was in a house band that played with singles who came into New York to Rochester on the way to New York from uh, Canada. I played this, as, as a, a, in the house band behind Sonny Stitt. I played in the house band behind uh, Slim Gaylord. Uh, those kind of bands, but they were not. Sonny Stitt was the only really bebop guy I got a chance to play with and, and for a whole week. And again, I'm going to school at Eastman, learning Beethoven. And I'm playing. I'm playing a whole week with Sonny Stitt, learning bebop. Exactly. I. I that's fantastic. Um, so, uh, but going. So you're telling me that Stan called you to to go on tour and and yes. When what? Do you have any idea what year this was? Whatever record the Sweet Rain is, you know, you hear that record we made, Sweet Rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, that that's like '67. In that time frame, he decided he was going to put a band together because he was happy with the record. Uh, after having tried to make it before, with not the kind of success he felt that he had with a, such a good band sounding great on that Sweet Rain record, he wanted, I guess, to put this band together to to tour this record. And then I told him what it would take, and he said it was too expensive, and hung up. Yeah, he was a cheap guy. Well, I found that out later on, but I, I, I you know, <laughs> I enjoyed a brief conversation. It was to the point, 
Yeah. And, and uh, he let me know how you felt. And uh, you know, when, one of the things, when you tell a guy your price, you, uh, are you prepared to accept no or yes, you know, and you accept those two consequences. In this case, the consequences was no. So I said, okay, I sat down and went on about my business. Talking to Ron Carter here on the Jake Feinberg Show. It's a sweltering day in New York, um, and he's uh, taking the time to uh, to hang with us for a minute. Um, can you talk about, uh, in your mind, uh, what you think would you be most interested to see in a film documentary about Stan Getz? Um, I can tell you right now the phone conversation between you and him about pay would not be in there. But if there was some... I, I think, uh, that's part of the Stan Getz, man. He had a history of low-paying guys, and I have a history of demanding what I'm worth. I'm okay with that kind of view of me and Stan, because you want us to, to be as full of interesting information and stuff that they can't find uh, on, on Channel 7, Eyewitness News in New York. I mean, I'm not afraid to have people here that Stan didn't want to hire me because he thought it cost too much money. Great, but that's, but that's part of the picture, man. You can't change the color of the picture because it doesn't suit your artistic taste. In, in any event, I think this is an important view of Stan. For as good as he played, he was very budget conscious. And uh, a lot of guys are not afraid to pay a price for a guy who thinks he's worth that kind of money, and they agree because they, what he contributes to their music. That's why that's what they talked about in the first place. If they're going to hire you on how much you pay, um, how little they can get you for, then somehow they're missing the boat of having a good guy play with them to help them play better. But having, having said that, I think that's a good part to have in the movie. I think I'd like to see you spend some time with how Stan gets stumbled on the stumbled on the, the, the Brazilian connection that he had and how important he was to bringing that Brazilian music to the fore of New York musicians' consciousness. Because once that record hit big, all the producers, both commercial and jazz, wanted to find out what that was and who could play that music. That was how that stuff got going, man. Do you remember what your, I mean, because Charlie Bird, in fairness, was the one that brought the, the rhythms to the States, but then Stan, can you talk about how Stan took it to the next level? First of all, he, he, it was a saxophone and a voice. And for whatever Charlie Bird did to it, it wasn't that complete the sound as you will find if you're into those clubs in Brazil, which I had a chance to go to much later, and in the 70s with the... Uh, my own band and, and the, with the club in uh, Rio de Janeiro called Mr. Rafina. But what Stan brought to it was a saxophone player accompanying a vocal melody, and that made a bigger impact on musicians because Charlie Birch was a much uh, a less forceful presentation. He just took a guitar, bass, and rushes and a little percussion. That wasn't as an impactful sound that the new, that the New York music scene was used to hearing, and Charlie Birch got washed away by, by Stan Getz's musical forcefulness, I felt. I like that terminology there, but he was able to, wasn't it also that he was able to interpret the lyrics, the lyrics, the lyrics of the, of the, uh, and be able to weave around that with his, with his, with his horn? That's not my view. I mean, it's, anytime you have, anytime you have a saxophone that's basically competing with a, a, a gentle sounding uh, 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 acoustic guitar because of the nature of the two instruments, Saxophone player, whatever his forcefulness is going to catch your ear first because it is so forceful. I think it was more of that than whether Stan, his difference of interpreting a melody with a saxophone. I think that wasn't a factor for me. Uh, I just I just liked the way he made the music have a real presence and, and, and some some really in-your-face kind of presentation. That appealed to me. I interviewed Stanley Clark uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, and he I'm quoting him here. Um, he goes, I remember one time hearing Ron Carter speak on Stan Getz. Ron had the biggest respect for Stan Getz as a musician. Now, he couldn't remember specifics, but I was curious as about, you know, okay, so setting aside your, you know, you didn't go on tour with him, whatever. You, I mean, he, you were playing on studio sessions. You did Cool Velvet. You did the Tony Bennett sessions. You did Sweet Rain. Uh, did you have respect for Stan as a musician? And explain specifically why. Absolutely. I wouldn't have done the record if I had no respect for him. Again, he's out of the left of young. He wasn't one of the guys, him with the Al Corn and Zoot Sims, and now Harry Allen, who are carrying the left of young tradition to its utmost. And I admire anyone who has the audacity to reckon to, to be into the footsteps of, some, of someone as gentle and as well known as Lester Young. Stan Getz was all over that tradition, and I admired anyone as I would anyone who, who, who acknowledges the historic value 
of an influence of their horn. And Stan did that whenever he played. Uh, I thought that was enough reason for me to say, this guy, this guy needs all, as I do with any act. And, and when you kind of say that, when you, when you kind of land on my respect for Stan Getz, the, the implication is that because I didn't respect someone maybe as much as Stan or more than Stan, my ability to perform with them changed. That's not the case. Yes, I have my personal views on a person and a plan and stuff, and yes, I like Stan's presence on the scene. I like, for me, what impact he had on the saxophone, but that didn't call in my ability to make him, to help him play as well. I thought as I could help him play as I did with someone else who was not a Stan Getz. I kind of get to, that's kind of has to be made clear, clear for your listeners because it sounds as I'm implying that because I had such a high regard for Stan Getz, I gave him more of me than I would give a saxophone player who was not Stan Getz. That is not me at all. Absolutely not. No, I mean this is I'm, I mean this is a documentary on Stan. We're not talking about Dizzy or anybody else that you've played with. Yeah, I understand that, man. But I have to, if I keep if if I don't make my position clear, it gives Stan gets more responsibility for me than I'm than I, than I'm giving somebody else. You know, I'm Stan. I think it's not there's not a clear picture of my loving his respect, loving and respecting him, and on the scene any more than someone else, and I'm not, and I can't let that go to say that they imply that he, I held him in a higher regard than somebody else. No, that's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Oh, I understand. And that's uh, important for me to get that clear for your biographers. Absolutely. Um, Ron, can you talk about the significance of Stan as far as somebody who, did you feel that he was somebody who always wanted to push the music forward? I never knew him that well. Didn't you talk about uh, I would love if you could just spend a minute or two. This is fascinating to me. The the sessions were not released until about five years ago, but you and Herbie and Elvin were the rhythm section for this really amazing album uh, that eventually got released, Tony Bennett and Stan Getz. And I wanted to know your memories. You've done thousands of sessions, but can you talk specifically about working with, you know, was that the first time you worked with Tony? And can you just talk about those sessions in general? Because a lot of that, that music is, is swinging. Okay, two things. I don't remember the date at all. What's, what's the name of the record? I have to get it so I could tell you that next month. What's, what's the name of the record? I'm going to get it for you. Um, it's, uh, it was re-released as, um, here we go. Let's see here. Tony Bennett. It's called, um, So it's called the uh, Rarities, Outtakes, and Other Delights, Volume 1, Tony Bennett on Columbia. Rarities, Outtakes, and Other Delights, Volume 1. And it says, Tony Bennett recorded this song, uh, uh, this, uh, let's see here. Uh, Have You Met Miss Jones? Uh, In 64, Herbie, Stan, Ron Carter, Elvin Jones. This recording, as well as others with this group, were not released until 2011 on the Tony Bennett Complete Collection box set on the Rarities, Outtakes, and Other Delights, Volume 1. That is so far off my memory banks now. You're speaking to you're speaking to a complete stranger right now. I have no memory of doing that. <laughs> you are well. You needed. There's a lot of the clips on YouTube, and your bass is a little bit low in the mix. But I will tell you, it swings so hard. <laughs> so what I'm going to have to do when I finish talking to you, go into my computer and go into YouTube, go into go into Amazon and try to find that because I have no memory or recollection of that at all. But it sounds like a great bunch of guys making those guys sound great. That's kind of our job. So you, you don't remember playing with Tony and Stan? No, I, not right now, no. Maybe if I hear the music and see the, see the pictures, I'm sure they have some photographs, it would jog my memory. But I'm completely, despite it being uh, 120 in New York p.m., I'm in the dark. <laughs> okay. When was the... Uh, uh, when do you think Stan... How did Stan impact... Uh, he was an old school improviser. Um, did you get the feeling that um, he was the type of cat who, if he didn't hear something, he would let the rhythm section sort of let them let them go off until he could 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 feel it. No, he, he was a kind of aggressive player. He thought he could hear everything, and he played like he did. So we had no we the rhythm sections that I know of had no. Didn't feel any reservations about tiptoeing around him until he got his footing. What is the um, what is the 
the the fit your favorite song or what is the 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 tune that you love the most that you played with Stan on? I have to see the library, and again, I haven't just this, this, this twenty been the material that's so new to me. I can't make a comment until I hear what that is because I have again I have no recoll. I'm almost embarrassed to say I have no collection, no recollection of that. And you keep referring to it, and I can't help you. No, I was so psyched. I couldn't even sleep last night. I was so excited to talk to you about this. Really? Well, because Tony's still around. We're eventually going to talk to Tony, but I was like, just to be able to talk. You you did two sessions. I'm just saying, go and check this stuff out because it swings so. It's just, it just, it's awesome. And it's really, you know, you guys were really. Well, I also wanted to ask you if you could tell the story about how you, how you actually wound up getting the gig with Miles. I don't know what that's. I don't know. I, I can answer that question. I don't mind doing, it, but I don't see how that relates to Tony Bennett to to uh, uh, Stan Getz. It's just a, it's just a, a, a separate. Uh... Well, no, because because I I want to know about listen, Miles and Stan were peers. They respected each other, and they both really came. To me, they both were at the forefront of this birth of the cool movement, and that's so. I just and you were right there with it. I mean, you joined Miles pretty 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 soon after that. Well, again, I, okay. Uh, my my, my uh, getting that gig with, with Miles came about when I was working with Art Farmer at a place called the Half Note, which is located on Spring Hudson down on the waterfront. And uh, I was working with Art Farmer with a ball, with a band of uh, Jim Hall and I think Walter Perkins playing drums. And Miles came in and said, asked me after our first set, asked me that he explained to me actually that that the band that he had was, was breaking up. Went and had left already to join the West Montgomery Quartet. As had Paul Chambers and Jimmy Cobb would leave after this tour was over. That was six weeks going on the West Coast. And he was looking for a bass player and wondered if I would go out on the West Coast with him for this tour. And I said, Mr. Davis, I'm very interested, but I'm right now working with Art Farmer, and if you will ask Art Farmer to release me of this second week of this gig that I'm committed to doing, I'm happy to go. If Art says no, I'm happy to stay here because I'm committed to having him and I'm learning some great music. So after the set was over, after he did the next set, he hung around and asked Art, was it okay to release me from this gig? And, and Art said yes. And, and uh, that set the ground for two relationships getting up to another level. With Art, <coughs> to know that someone in this band would ask his permission to leave to join the fabulous Miles Davis was a feather in Art's cap because he knew that this person who was asking for this release had such a high guard for him. He was willing to risk his career improvement theoretically to stay with Art longer. And secondly, I set the tone for Miles that I had high regard for my commitment to whoever the leader was, and that included Art Farmer. And if I'm with your band, it now includes you. So I set the tone for a lot of interesting conversations and relationships, and I'm happy to have been part of that. Switching back to Stan, I know you got to get out of here. Um, can you talk about, in, in today's world, I, I believe you're at Juilliard, you're teaching there now? Yes. So... Explain to everybody across the world listening right now, and even to like why to to future generations of students, why is Stan gets relevant? Not his personality; he was a Jekyll and Hyde personality. But as far as his, why is he relevant in 2016 to the lexicon of of music? You have to ask those guys. You're asking me to put myself in their position that and I can't do that. All I know is, I if he were if he were to call me today, and I'm then kind of tongue-in-cheek, but you get my point of view. If I could get in, 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 in a call for him today to join him for a, a, a session within a half hour, I'd be the first guy in line at the studio to open the door because he's a great player. That record for musicians only, man, it is so far out. I mean, it's so happening that to have a chance to play with him in that kind of heated uh, 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 improvisationatory uh, environment I mean, everyone's on fire, and to be a part of that situation, something I, le- I long for, man. And if he would call me, I'd say absolutely, and I wouldn't even ask him what he's going to pay me. So after the dates, I wouldn't be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> can you could you just before I let you go? Can you just talk about how the three of them worked, burned together so well, but left space? I'm talking about Sonny, Dizzy, and Stan. I, I'd have to be there. You know, you asked me to be a critic now. And I, well, you I'm just talking about the I'm, album. You talk about the album. You know, just, I mean, yeah, 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 but if those guys are part of the album, they, they are what it, what it is, you know. And, and uh, you, know, you kind of put me on the spot because I can't answer that question because, first, first of all, I haven't heard it in, in, in at least nine months. It's, when it's on the thing on my desk right now that I played because the, the enthusiasm, the, the level that each guy pushes the other one to reach 
is something that I'm, I'm sure that they hadn't reached this kind of intensity before, and they, uh, they understood that this environment is so so on top of it that they have to maintain the integrity of the music by maintaining the level of the band set by the band itself. And that's something I can explain to you how those how Sonny Stitt and, and Dizzy and, and uh, Stan were able to play the whole record on that kind of incredible level of intensity and improv. Stan gets it's, it's so far on top of his game that it's just stunning to wonder why he doesn't do this more often. Well, maybe this is the first time he was in that kind of environment that made that necessary. He was not the boss. Mm. The music was the boss. Dizzy Gillespie was the boss. <laughs> Sonny Stitt was the boss. And they told him, Stan, get to London, get in this boat, and let's get this, get this party started. 